Hello, my wonderful, beautiful friends, guys. Welcome back to r slash malicious compliance, where in today's episode, a smug Karen tries to be petty only to have it backfire on her. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's super satisfying lineup of stories. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't. And as always, your story submissions can be sent right here. So this happened a few years ago. At the time, I was 17 years old. I had just started working at a smallish cafe run by a well-known family in our area. I knew some people who had worked there before, and they told me for the most part the owners were great. They were very chilled and laid back when it was slow. They weren't bad about breathing down the employees' necks. Their oldest daughter, who also helped run everything, was the one who was very peculiar, and we'll call her Karen. I'm officially diagnosed with a hearing deficiency. Not enough to be considered deaf, but more than hard of hearing, so I wear hearing aids on my day of work. So on my first day before we opened, my coworkers asked me if they can do anything else to help me out, and we eventually started talking about hearing aids in general. While talking, I mentioned they had Bluetooth capabilities, so I could play music through them. Not that I would, but I could. Karen had been in the room at the same time, and she said, You can't wear those. No earbud policy. And then she tapped on the policy's paper on the wall. I protested, explaining that they're hearing aids and not earbuds, and that I wouldn't be using them to listen to any music when I was working. Karen then told me that I didn't need them because I wasn't considered fully deaf, and I was doing this to get around the no earbud policy, directly quoting when I said they could play music, so she told me to go without them. I'm thinking, I can't wear them? Okay, let's see how this goes. So I placed them into the case in my bag and started my shift. I couldn't understand my trainer, couldn't hear the customers, couldn't hear when orders were called to be sent out, and things were going extremely slow. A couple of warm pastries burned since I wasn't able to hear the timers. Simple sentences also had to be repeated multiple times, with people basically yelling at me just for me to be able to piece a few words together. Now, I guess the cherry on top was me ignoring one of the owners when she tried speaking to me. Karen came up to me and tried addressing me about it until she finally realized what was going on after she repeated herself five times. By the end of that shift, I was allowed to wear my hearing aids. No questions asked. Yeah, guys, I don't know where Opie's from, but I'm pretty sure what the Karen asked Opie to do had to have violated some workplace laws. Like, guys, I don't think you as a person in a position of power can ask someone to remove their hearing aid because you don't think that certain employee is fully deaf. Like, that'd be like your boss asking you to not wear your glasses because you aren't fully blind, right? My ex-husband and I had a great divorce. And even though he cheated on me after 12 years and two kids under four, I really wanted to do things differently than my parents did during their divorce. I never said anything negative about him, and I tried very hard to defend him when the kids got upset with him. I extended invitations to the woman he left me for so she wouldn't feel uncomfortable with me, and we became friends. She was basically their stepmom, so why not include her on everything? On the holidays, we all had one big family dinner. He and her, and me and my boyfriend. This made everyone comfortable, and the kids never had to choose one side or the other, as we were all on the same page. It was such a great relationship, that when I had back surgery, I recovered at his house, and she cooked for me. He and I were coaches for the kids' basketball and baseball teams, and I helped at their wedding 13 years later. Now this wasn't easy for me, as he moved to another state to raise her children, leaving me to raise ours on my own. She quit her job when they got together, and I had to return to work to support my kids but I needed to keep the resentment and bitterness away from my kids. So all of this sets the tone for the divorce. But when he initially left, I spoke to a lawyer and got a separation agreement that was really great for me. My ex asked that I not take half of his retirement, but instead he would pay X in child support and additional Y in alimony. Because at the time, he was making a lot of money and I was a stay-at-home mom with a country club membership. And yuck, I hate saying that, but that was only to set the scene. Now, normally alimony ends after five years, but because I didn't get half of the 401k, the only condition on ending it was it would end on my remarriage or my death, and he agreed with all of it. The thing is, when he left me to move down to where she lived, he left his cushy job and took this promising but not delivering position that really screwed him financially. But he never went back to the lawyer to get the child support or alimony reduced. Instead, he borrowed money from his mother. When I discovered he was mooching off of her, I suggested to her that she stop paying for him when he finally got back on his feet. She would never do that and continued paying for his life and her to be a stay-at-home mom. He did come to me and ask if I would accept regular child supports and half the alimony. And then later, when he was really earning money, he would pick back up on his past due amount. 
Not wanting to make waves in an otherwise great divorce, I said yes, and kept track each month of what was owed in a shared spreadsheet with him, so he could see how far in debt he was getting each month. He ended up owing me $100 a month over 10 years, but he said when the kids aged out of child support, he would continue to pay the same amount to make up for the alimony, which totaled $120,000. When my daughter aged out, he continued to pay the same amount, putting a small dent in what he owed for 3 years. Then, as soon as my son aged out, I mean, two weeks after he joined the Marines, my ex called me and told me there was no way he was going to continue paying me for the next X amount of years, and that I could take him to court if I wanted, but there's no effing way that he would pay me another cent. Now, of course, hearing that, this completely blew my mind, as we had such a fantastic relationship, and that came out of nowhere. I was completely freaked out, but I took his advice, contacted an attorney, and I sent all of his calls to voicemail, per my attorney's advice, and then I took him to court. The best thing was, prior to the hearing, my attorney put a lien on both homes, so he couldn't change ownership to his mom or wife prior to the court hearing. I still have the phone call recording when he realized this, and the horrible names he called me for doing that. So, since I had kept such immaculate records from the day he changed payments and he was aware of his debt rising each month, it was a slam dunk for my attorney. Instead of making small payments for a few years, he had 30 days to pay me $120,000 in full. Now with that, unfortunately, the kids now have to choose which parent they visit on holidays, but that wasn't my fault. I was willing to continue as is and not put any strain on the family relationship. And for those who are wondering, yes, he did cheat on her two times before they got married but she had quit her job when they got together because she had found a sugar daddy. So she had nothing to fall back on and nowhere to go, so she stayed with him. Guys, that was such a super satisfying malicious compliance. Like, I absolutely love the stories where people decide to make the OP's life harder and then tell them to take it to courts, only to have it bite them in the end. Like, I absolutely love how he never thought he'd have to pay his ex-wife another dime and then was slapped with having to pay $120,000 in 30 days. Ugh, imagine the look on that man's face. Okay, so I run a repair shop where I employ a bunch of local kids, ages 16 plus, to learn skills and make some money while we generally sit around and talk about the world while fixing things. So we had a client come in with a busted electronic. We fixed it up for her and gave her a decent discount on the work. Her final bill for parts and 4 hours of labor was $100 even, discounted down from $220. Now, little did I know, the woman was a Karen. She didn't like the bill, she didn't like the work, and she claimed that we had broken something else. She claimed that the kid who did the work didn't know what she was doing. And I want to note that she did, I supervised her. And that the kid who helped her in the front room was rude to her. He wasn't, but she didn't like the little pride flag pin he was wearing. She demanded to see the manager, so I popped out. I listened to her tear into my kids, validated how she was feeling, But then I pointed out the work she had asked for was done, and it was done correctly, and her bill was due on pickup of the piece. The last straw for her came when she pulls out a credit card, and I had to inform her that we don't accept that particular card. She literally looks at me and says, Do you know who I am? Which I still didn't, and I still don't, don't care. And I told her we'd take a personal check. So she writes out a check, problem solved. I deposited the day's checks and get a note from my bank that one had bounced. Of course, it was her check. I called her the next day to inform her that her check had been returned for insufficient funds, and that she needed to come back in and pay for her bill, plus the extra fee for the returned check. All of these fees, just to point out, were clearly outlined on the service agreement she'd signed, and we'd already discounted her $120 just to be nice. Anyway, the Karen rolls into the office carrying a bag, and I knew exactly what was going on. She drops, of course, a bag of pennies on the front desk. The woman's breathing heavily, we're on the second floor and she had taken the stairs. She then announces triumphantly that she's here to pay her bill. She tells us she needs to go get the rest of our hard-earned money, with a sneer of course. The kid at the front desk looks like he's about to cry, so I stop working on the thing I'm working on and I take over. I ask her, so how many more bags do you have? She says that the nice people at the bank loaded them up in her car. She didn't count them. I told her it was fine, but we'd wait for her to bring them all up and then settle her bill. She was expecting a bigger reaction, I think. Either that, or she hadn't thought this through. 10,000 pennies, plus the extra $25, weighs a lot, and she just committed to carrying them through a parking lot and up a flight of stairs. One of my kids, bless his heart, offered to help her carry them, and she refused. Finally, shaking and sweaty, she deposited the last bag on the countertop. 
The pennies were loose, not in coin rolls. She had done some work to prove her point. Now, what she hadn't counted on was that we'd need to count the pennies before she could leave. So while the other kids took care of the other clients and fixed things in the back, the front desk guy and I counted up the pennies. The Karen soon started to realize that this was going to take a while and she tried to leave. I told her that she couldn't leave until we signed off on her bill, since at this point she was in violation of her service agreement and she had passed a bad check. We couldn't just take her word for it. I tell her if she leaves, I would call police if she left without paying. Now I will admit, I was kind of talking out of my ass, but she'd managed to tick me off a little. The other clients in the shop came and went, and we counted. Phone calls came in and were handled by my kids, and we counted. The woman sat down in a chair. She stood up again, walked around the office, and we counted. After a while, she said, just forget it. She then took out $125 in bills. We signed off on her agreement and she started to leave. Another one of my kids, bless his heart, asked her if she wanted help carrying the pennies back to her car. She then looked at all of us with a face of sheer panic and she mumbled, no, no thank you, just keep them. And she bolted. The whole shop was silent for a moment and then one of the kids started giggling and nobody could stop. People coming in thought we were nuts and I finally had to banish everybody to the back room until they could breathe again. We then load the bags into my vehicle and use the elevator that she had walked by a few times. We then took them to the bank and used the coin machine to deposit them and then wrote a donation to our local shelter for the amount she dropped off. The woman then posted something nasty on Facebook about it and she got flack for it. Now she had of course posted earlier what she was gonna do and she got called out with her own post. My favorite response was something like, You said you were going to pay your bill in pennies. You paid your bill in pennies, so what went wrong? Please don't pay your bills in pennies, folks, especially if you're doing it just to be a dick. Guys, the funniest part of the story is that the woman was oblivious to the elevator that was in the building. Like, oh my goodness, that was definitely the cherry on top, and that's what she gets for being petty, right? Okay, so another hilarious story where Karen tried to pay in pennies was shared, and here it is. I was working at a gas station about 20 years ago. So one evening, this lady comes in, dumps like five or six handfuls of penny on the counter, and states her preferred brand of smokes. Now ordinarily, our cashiers would just tell someone to F off if they were trying this. But I was pretty chill at the time, and I had nothing better to do than run the register and stuff my face with food from the deli case. So cue the malicious compliance. I just said, okay, but I'll have to take other customers. I'll count this in between, okay? Hearing that, she objects. She says, It's all there. I counted it already. To which I reply, If my drawer comes up wrong, I'll get in trouble. I have to count it. Sorry. She then starts stomping around the store all mad, throwing her arms around, etc. And I start counting, meticulously setting the pennies aside in stacks of 10, and pausing every time a customer comes in. All the while, the lady's acting like she's been stabbed through the hand. Maybe half a dozen customers and 10 minutes later, I'm nearing the end of the pile. She's still standing by the door, getting more and more impatient, bitching at everybody who comes through. I was giving the other customers priority, so they didn't care, of course. Anyway, I finished counting, and she's short maybe 15 cents. Who could remember? Now, it was fairly common for people to raid the penny dish to cover the cost of a pack of cigarettes, if they were short. But she had promised me that it was all there. So I take the overflowing free penny dish and move it behind the counter before calling her over. I then tell her, hey, you're this amount of cents short. The woman says, can't I just cover it from the dish? Where is it? To which I say, what dish? She then says, there's a dish. There's always a dish, a dish of pennies. You took it away. I then give her a puzzled look, wave my hands over the counter and say, there's no dish. I don't know what you're talking about. The woman is enraged. She cusses me out for a while and I just shrug it off. She left without her cigarettes, of course. My boss came over afterwards and told me that I didn't have to count those or even take them. The dude didn't get me at all, but I just played it straight and was like, oh, okay. A few years ago, I worked at a big retail company and had for many years. Eventually, I went through enough grad school education to get my license to work at a higher level. Much more pay, more job satisfaction, more responsibilities, fancy title, but the market was rough. I stayed on with my company to work in a floater position, where I would cover a large area and work at all the stores within that area on a rotating but irregular basis. Eventually, I wanted to get to a staff position where I would have a single store assigned. 
The area was huge, the further store being over a hundred miles from my home, and that's exactly where I was assigned to train for the new role. It was a tough store. Folks in my position were robbed and assaulted at gunpoints, and the neighborhood was very unfriendly. The volume at the store was among the highest in the state, and staff turnover was, as you might expect, extreme. Well, after training, I wasn't really being scheduled to float to other stores, once a month at most. I asked to be scheduled a little more diversely since most of the stores in my area were much closer to my home and didn't require 4 hours of driving a day. Bossman told me that I was the only floater experienced enough to handle that store. Now I didn't buy it, but what can you do, right? Well, a colleague told me about the mileage reimbursement policy. Floaters working at a store more than 50 miles from home can file for reimbursement of mileage over that 50 miles each way and can even include meals. So I filled a few of those out and sent them to my boss to sign. He didn't quite refuse, but he never actually signed and filed them. I suspected as soon as I left his office at our district center, he tossed them out. Bossman later tells me that they must have been lost in the system. Eventually, the same colleague showed me how to fax those same forms to accounts payable, bypassing the district bossman, so I started doing just that. So one day, my bossman calls me in a panic. He wants me to stop filing the forms. I then asked to be floated closer to home, but he wouldn't budge. He needs me at that miserable store. He promises me that he'll make me a staff role at that store if I promise to stop faxing those forms. Staff roles are a promotion and usually come with better pay and a few other little conveniences, so I agree. Bossman says there won't be a pay bump right away, but that'll come down the road. And of course, it never happened. Two years later, the situation at the store has become too toxic, even for me. I asked to step down from the staff position to be a floater again and be allowed to float other stores. Bossman says that I'm already a floater, never was in a staff position, and that he can't let me work at other stores because it's better for me and the customers if I stay there for familiarity. Floaters don't get scheduled to stores exclusively, so I'm being singled out because they're still desperate to cover that dump of a store. Now I'm livid, so I start looking. It took me months, but eventually I found an opportunity to make my dream career transition. So I put in my formal notice, and that's when the fun started. So remember the whole mileage reimbursement policy? Well, I kept meticulous track of all of my shifts, and there's no statute of limitations baked into the policy, so I start filling out those reimbursement forms to retroactively cover every single shift from the past two years. I skipped the meal part because I didn't really want to go through the effort of finding receipts. I then had a friendly store manager sign off on them, and I started sending them to accounts payable directly again. I didn't fax them in all at once, but for each shift in my final two weeks, I faxed a few dozen in. I figured, what do I have to lose? Worst case scenario, accounts payable declines the forms. On my last few shifts, I start getting checks from accounts payable. Not added to my paycheck, but sent to me directly. Mileage reimbursements are non-taxable income, so this was all tax-free money coming to me. It must have taken a while for the charges to show up on a balance sheet, because a few weeks after my final paycheck, I get a call from my now former boss man, and he wasn't happy. He got some big loss prevention manager involved, and together, they started saying that I was breaking some rule by requesting the payments. They specifically claimed that I was ineligible, because I agreed that I wouldn't be eligible in a staff position. They then threatened legal action against me if I didn't remit the full amounts back that same week. But I had the email chain from when Bossman said that I was never staff, I was always a floater. I politely referenced that email before letting them know firmly that because I was lied to, our prior agreement didn't apply, and I was fully eligible all along. Corporate policy, as confirmed by HR, agreed with me, so I let them know that I wasn't returning a single penny. In the end, the reimbursements amounted to well over $21,000, and I transitioned into my dream job. Now, I could say that I would trade that money back for the time I lost commuting to that miserable store. Four hours every shift. But all that pressure motivated me to make the best career move of my life. The great satisfaction of not only professionally surpassing my old boss, but getting to tell him that his lies cost him way more on the way out is almost priceless. What a sleazy lying boss, guys, and I can't believe OP put up with that crap for over two years. Like commuting four hours a day without a pay bump, and was then told they couldn't even claim the mileage anymore and to stop it. Yeah, I'd be looking into getting some nuclear revenge on that sleazy manager. And that, my friends, is our slash malicious compliance. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's super satisfying stories. If you did, hit that thumbs up. And if you missed yesterday's episode on the channel, it's an r slash I do work here, lady. 
where a brand spanking new smug employee decides to berate and harass OP, not knowing that OP is his boss. It's such a satisfying story, so guys, go check it out if you haven't. And myself and Stevie Boy will see you guys in the next one. We love you.